UK is bracing for an early election on the 12th of December. The leaders of the four biggest parties in Westminster have been given a thrilling by members of the public. You are misleading the public. You are trying to coach your propaganda. But us, if you're prepared to be that shameless, that misleading, why should we believe anything? Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post. Here are some of the media stories that we're covering this week. The British are in election mode once again, and their news outlets are proving to be no more adept at dealing with a lying politician than American ones are. My beauty. My beauty. Purpose advertising. Those feel-good ads designed to make you feel good about buying something. Filipino President Rodrigo Duterte is taking on the media once again, specifically the country's biggest broadcaster and representing the unrepresented. A song for the politically dispossessed. Britain is about to vote in what has come to be known as its Brexit election, the one Prime Minister Boris Johnson called after failing to get Parliament to agree to his deal to leave the European Union. This is the UK's third election in just five years, and that does not include the Brexit referendum of 2016, which is how we got here. The media angles in this story are too numerous for comfort. Johnson's Conservatives are doing what front-runners tend to do, keeping exposure to a minimum, shunning interviewers and channels that might give them a rough ride. But they're also leading the way in spreading misinformation, even blatantly misrepresenting themselves online. Both Boris Johnson and his main rival, Jeremy Corbyn of the Labour Party, know that most of the country's newspapers are Conservative. That is a given in any British election. But it goes further than that. The perception of bias is not limited to the papers. It has bled into the broadcast sector. And that includes the publicly owned national broadcaster, the BBC. Our starting point this week is London. Out of time. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Elections in the digital age can be confusing. Often, that is by design. Take this supposed fact-checking Twitter account, posted just after the first TV debate of the British election campaign. It was not what it claimed to be. And this site, set up to look like the opposition Labour Party's election manifesto page, complete with the party's leader and colours, it was not what it appeared to be. Both fake platforms were created by the governing Conservatives, a party that has moved beyond old-fashioned spin and stretching the truth, embracing misrepresentation and outright misinformation. You use the term misinformation. I would be stronger than that. I'd use the term deception or, de or lying. Um, and there's been a great deal of this in the campaign, particularly, I have to say, from the Conservative Party. It's a departure from truth, departure from reality, the creation of a fake universe making a series of fake claims. Starting at 10 Downing Street in the Prime Minister's office. Boris Johnson is a British throwback, born into privilege and schooled at Eton, which is as elite as it gets. He knows what lies one can get past a news outlet. He used to do it from the inside. In the early 1990s, Johnson was a journalist covering Brussels for The Telegraph, sensationalizing and sometimes inventing stories about the EU's difficult bureaucracy. The paper's owner said he was so effective that Johnson greatly influenced British opinion on relations with Europe. By 2016, that came full circle. Johnson campaigned on the Brexit side in the referendum, repeatedly telling voters that leaving the EU would result in a financial windfall for the National Health Service, the NHS. Untrue. Lots of politicians lie. Few splash those lies, complete with fabricated numbers, all over a campaign bus. Once he got into Downing Street in July, Johnson vowed over and over that by October 31st, Britain would be out of the EU, that failure just wasn't an option. I'd rather be, I'd rather be dead in a ditch. Boris Johnson's constant lying has divided Conservatives. He's alienated some, like this longtime columnist, and even those who still back him, this former editor, for example, are troubled by what they hear. This is a real change in UK politics, and I think it has somewhat come from across 
the Atlantic. The lying has become much more blatant. Again and again and again, he said... So we are getting ready to come out on the 31st of October. Oh, October the 31st. No ifs or buts. And he knew when he said it that he didn't have the power to make that happen. Saying something that you know to be untrue doesn't quite carry the consequence that it used to. He claimed that there is a zero tolerance of Islamophobia in the Conservative Party. Actually, the problem is right inside the Conservative Party, and that's before you get to the Prime Minister's own um, Islamophobic remarks. We have the continual uh, claim by Boris Johnson that he's building 40 new hospitals. 40 new hospitals will be built as a, as a result well, they, of the no, decisions. No, you can, can you say, they're not new hospitals, are they? He this isn't is actually building a single net new yes, hospital. And it's one of many, many lies which the Prime Minister has uttered. When you have a situation where there is this massive concentration of ownership in the print media, and that is overwhelmingly weighted towards the Tories, owned by pro-Tory billionaires, staffed by people who are in their positions because of their political contacts, usually with Tory politicians. That is a system that fundamentally, in my view, is unlikely to produce proper scrutiny and accountability. The pro-conservative bias is most obvious and problematic in the British print sector. 65% of the newspaper market is controlled by just two companies, the Murdoch family's News UK, which publishes The Sun and The Times, and the Daily Mail's parent company, The Daily Mail and General Trust. Throw in other right-wing papers like The Telegraph, The Express, The Daily Star, and the field tilts even further in Boris Johnson's favour. The evidence of the pro-conservative bias of those papers is more than anecdotal, a headline here or an op-ed there. Loughborough University conducted a study of print coverage, article by article, of the election campaign. Each positive story was graded with a plus one, a negative story with a minus one. The study concluded that over the past three weeks, Johnson's Conservatives averaged plus 21. Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party, minus 73. And there always has been, but particularly in this election campaign, there is a heavy bias uh, in favour of the Conservatives. That is because the offer on the Labour side is as hard left wing as we have seen for decades. And many people stand to lose an awful lot of money, newspaper proprietors included. Remember, newspapers are businesses that have to make money. So we've seen a much heavier approach from newspapers across the board. Hello there, you're watching the press preview. Our first look at what's on the front pages. As the net effect of that is the newspapers, which are unregulated and therefore allowed to be biased, tend to set the news agenda for the broadcasters that are regulated and are supposed to be balanced. So I've got an empty chair here. There have been plenty of cases of broadcasters asking tough questions of conservatives, including absent ones. I wanted to ask him about things like this. Sky News, having been stood up by a party official, interviewed an empty chair instead. Channel 4, which hosted a leaders' debate on climate change that Boris Johnson refused to attend, instead a reminder, the ice caps are put an ice sculpture in his place. It was melting. However, any measure of British broadcasting output starts with the publicly funded BBC. As the campaign has unfolded, criticism of the BBC and allegations of a pro-Johnson, pro-conservative bias have mounted. There have been a number of cases where the BBC editing of stories has raised very serious questions about its craftsmanship and also about its impartiality. One is why Mr Johnson was asked about whether he believed that truth mattered. How important is it for someone in your position of power to always tell the truth? At that point the audience laughed. The following day the BBC edited out the laughter so they only, the, the, the audience only saw the applause. And I think that the issue of trust... There have been other similar incidents that the BBC has publicly admitted were editorial mistakes. In an article published in The Guardian, its director of news and current affairs said critics who call those incidents evidence of a pro-conservative agenda are mistaken. It is not too late 
We have an interview prepared. Been... The BBC's most prominent interviewer, Andrew Neil, has also shamed Boris Johnson for refusing to take his questions as all the other party leaders have. Questions of trust. Questions we'd like to put to Mr Johnson so you can hear his replies. The pinnacle of the BBC's campaign coverage was going to be grilling each of these party leaders. You're going to borrow hundreds of mil hundred, couple of hundred million more for nationalisation. You're going to borrow billions for the Green Deal. Borrow, borrow. Is there no limit to what can go on the corporate credit card? What they should have done, quite frankly, is they should have said, Boris Johnson doesn't get another interview on the BBC until he agrees a date with Andrew Neil. That's the kind of response a public service broadcaster would have, that we are securing some degree of fairness to this election, at least the same degree of scrutiny for the sitting Prime Minister as the person who's challenging him. But the BBC obviously doesn't feel that it can do that. Some of the tactics Britons are seeing in this Brexit-based election have never been seen before. A party in government flagrantly misrepresenting itself online. Some aspects are more familiar. Conservative newspapers backing their candidate, excoriating his rivals. And then there is the constant, Boris Johnson, relying on the same tactics that he honed as a journalist, then used in the referendum campaign and took all the way into number 10, lying. It's not just what he does, it's what got him where he and his country are today. No ifs or buts. We're discussing other media stories that are on our radar this week with one of our producers, Tarek Nafa. Tarek, in the Philippines, President Rodrigo Duterte is once again going after the country's biggest news and entertainment network, ABS-CBN. In what way? He's threatening to strip the network of its license, which comes up for renewal next year, saying, if you're expecting it to be renewed, I'm sorry. I will see to it that you're out. Duterte threatened to do this before. Back in 2016, he accused ABS-CBN of swindling him for not airing paid political advertising. He's also complained of biased reporting, much of it which is being done on Duterte's so-called war on drugs and the extrajudicial killings of thousands of people. Filipino lawmakers are now being urged to resist Duterte's efforts to shut down the network. Human Rights Watch says Duterte is misusing the government's regulatory powers to settle a score, part of a broader crackdown on media outlets and civil society groups that dare criticize him. Okay, on to a story that we touched upon last week. Bloomberg News in the U.S., owned by the newly declared Democratic candidate for president, Michael Bloomberg, announcing that it would not be investigating its owner during the course of this campaign. What's the fallout been? As we reported last week, no investigative reporting on Bloomberg by Bloomberg News. Nor will they be doing investigative journalism on other Democratic candidates. The Trump White House is not impressed. It's rescinded the press credentials of Bloomberg reporters, so they can't cover the president either. The Trump campaign called Bloomberg's editorial policy troubling and wrong. And it's hard to argue of that. Those other Democratic contenders are just as deserving of scrutiny as President Trump. And one of those Democratic hopefuls, Elizabeth Warren, went on Bloomberg News to talk about the billionaire class running for public office. America. And for me, What's broken in America is we've got a country that is working great for those at the top, an economy that's working great for those at the top, and a democracy that is working great for those at the top. It's just not working for much of anyone else. And that's why I'm so concerned about Michael Bloomberg jumping into this race, dropping $37 million in one week on ad buys. I don't believe that elections ought to be for sale. With one already in the Oval Office and another one, a media mogul spending big money to replace him, it's hard to argue that running for president is not a billionaire's game. OK, thanks, Tark. Turning now to an advertising trend, a technique that more and more companies are adopting to sell their goods, purpose marketing. In the 21st century, traditional product-focused marketing campaigns no longer get the clicks, the likes, and the shares that advertisers crave. As a result, companies have turned to a socio-political kind of brand messaging, one that adopts a cause in order to boost profits. 
However, that approach can backfire. Earlier this year, an ad produced by Gillette jumped on the Me Too hashtag bandwagon and the subsequent movement to protect women from sexual harassment in the workplace. Gillette tweaked its longtime slogan, the best a man can get, turning it into the best men can be, and then got beat up online for appropriating a social movement for the sake of sales. And Gillette's not the only brand to be caught out with its purpose marketing. The Listening Post's Johanna Hoos now on a marketing trend and the challenge of striking a balance and the right tone between purpose and profit. Believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything. Racial yeah. equality. My beauty. My beauty. My beauty. My say. Female empowerment. This is what happens when ice cream is just two degrees warmer than it should be. The realities of climate change. Bullying. The Me Too movement against sexual Toxic harassment. Masculinity. For big brands, just selling a product is no longer enough. Is this the best a man can get? Advertising doesn't work like it used to, and getting people's attention is really difficult. Companies can't just talk about what they make anymore, because we've seen it before, and we're not paying attention. So what so many brands are doing is show up with conversations that we want to be part of, and if they can go along for the ride, that's the best route available to them. We're experiencing a shift in generational values, and what that's leading to is younger people in particular looking to buy from and work for companies that are more conscientious, that consider the bigger picture. What young people can see is rising inequality, increased political polarizations, and because of this, there is you know, a need for businesses to consider more than just profit not something they've ever been particularly good at. He said, they said, she said, I said, no way. Which you begs the question, the socio-political causes companies pick, the stances they take, do they amount to anything more than on-screen publicity stunts, strategically adopted to draw the clicks, the likes, the shares their businesses rely on? In the case of Pepsi, the answer seems to be no. In 2017, the company put out an ad appropriating the Black Lives Matter movement to sell its product. But it backfired and has since been held up as a prime example of how not to do purpose marketing. Because Pepsi attempted to challenge decades of police brutality and racial inequality with a can of soda and a supermodel, a white one. So we have a serious issue here that's meaningful to people and they belittled it by using one of the most wealthy women in the world as their spokesmodel. We are the lions. It makes we it seem trite and certainly opportunistic. It didn't seem authentic. It seemed like just glomming onto a cause and it really rang false for people who care about those issues. At no point, I guess, have Pepsi ever intimated through their advertising or marketing that they're aligned with the Black Lives Matter movement. And because of that, the ad was seen as reductive. Um, making a pop culture moment out of uh, protest against police brutality. We've seen one after another disastrous outcome of brands that try to, you know, use fake purpose opportunistically to connect with consumers, and it backfires. Pepsi is not the only brand trying to master the art of purpose marketing. It's been going on far too long. In January this year, Razor Brent Gillette, famous for its longtime slogan, the best a man can get, switched up its catchphrase to write the Me Too wave, releasing its the best man can be campaign aimed at addressing toxic masculinity and hoping to sell a few razors in the process. Because we, we believe in the best in men. The ad caused a huge backlash, not least because Gillette's newfound moral compass is somewhat of a departure from the message the company has spread for decades. To say the right thing, to act the right way. So let's think about Gillette's history for a minute. They are one of the very first mass marketers. The Gillette Cavalcade of Sports is on the air. Gillette showed up in our living rooms, uninvited for years and years at a time, promoting the idea that what a man is supposed to do is beat another man senseless. So if Gillette shows up today in a world where they can't buy our attention and seeks to earn it 
by putting a message into the world, yeah, you can be a cynic so, and say they're trying to are. manipulate us. But what I see is a you heartfelt guys, effort to say, let's think about this. So I think the reason why there was such backlash to this is because it came off like Gillette was lecturing and tisk tisking men for not being the right kind of father, the right kind of man. I think what they meant to be was aspirational, like let's be better. Because the boys watching today. But they did it so badly. Will be the men of tomorrow. It came off as opportunistic, like they were just trying to find a cause and oh, this one will do. What? is unhelpful is flashing the pan type of activity. What you want to see is a brand or a business really believe in a cause and commit to supporting it over a period of time. Brands can really make a difference using the power that they have through their platforms and their resources and use it to shift mindsets and address social challenges and call out injustice. And in doing that, brands can help issues move on a lot more quickly than they would have done without that kind of exposure. Daniel Brindis agrees. He works at Greenpeace in charge of campaigning for forestry. Last year, a British supermarket chain, Iceland, approached the organization wanting to use one of its campaign videos for an ad on the consequences of the farming of dirty palm oil, destroying natural habitats. There's a rangtan in my bedroom and I don't know what to do. She plays with all my teddies and keeps borrowing my shoe. Greenpeace allowed Iceland to use the video and while the UK regulator responsible for vetting ads banned it for allegedly breaking the rules of political advertising, it went viral and reignited discussions over the consequences of deforestation. Why were you in my bedroom? I really want to know. There's a human in my forest, and I don't know what to do. At Greenpeace, we often say no permanent friends, no permanent enemies. So if a company is doing the right thing and taking positive action that is genuine, deserves visibility and deserves praise. Greenpeace UK approached this with cynicism and with scrutiny, and the, the fact is, is that they felt like the actions on the part of Iceland represented a legitimate investment in trying to address the problem. They sent their CEO to go to Indonesia and see firsthand the scale of the problem with dirty palm oil production. He took away my mother and I'm scared. When brands do get it right, they can prove a useful ally in the fight for social justice. And it's not bad for profits either. Following the ad, Iceland's sales rose and its brand perception amongst consumers improved significantly. Calling a dream crazy is not an insult. Similarly, a commercial produced by sports brand Nike, featuring NFL quarterback Colin Kaepernick, who lost his job taking a stance on racial inequality, put the Black Lives Matter movement back in the spotlight. So don't ask if your dreams are crazy. Ask if they're crazy enough. And at the same time, the company saw its share price shoot up. Nike's ad was the voice of someone actively engaged in the Black Lives Matter movement. That gave the ad a lot more authenticity, but still it's important to ask questions about businesses' broader practices and Nike's working conditions and the practices in Asia are something that still needs to be questioned. At the same time that Nike is coming out championing women athletes and saying they should stand up and, you know, growl and make noise. So if they want to call you crazy, fine. Show them what crazy can do. They have class action lawsuit for, you know, underpaying their female employees. We don't hear that. What we hear is all the marketing noise around the cause of championing women. As consumers, you don't have to. It's not your job to fully understand an issue, which means you may not be hearing the whole issue. Everyone is different. One measure of how far this trend in marketing has come, it's now reached a point of being satirized. Imagine if a single bottle could be enjoyed by two people. From the same bottle at the same time. So we've got a drink from it together. Together? Are you OK with that? It's fine. Oasis, the soft drink company, produced this ad and calls it refreshingly honest on what the true purpose of purpose marketing really is. Harmony. Just a few billion sales away. Not in shops, doesn't fit on shelves. And finally, for months now, resentment and anger have boiled over onto the Arab streets of the Middle East and North Africa, from Baghdad to Beirut to Algiers. 
Each of the countries has its own unique political issues. The various protests reflect that. But there's a common thread here. Citizens have turned against the region's aging, corrupt, ineffective political class, which does not serve or represent them. And neither do state institutions, the news media included. Jawan Safadi is a Palestinian Israeli. He knows what it's like to go unrepresented. And while he hails from Nazareth, a song that he wrote and posted earlier this year could just as easily have described the state of affairs elsewhere in the Arab world. We'll leave you now with a clip from what Safadi calls the police song. And we'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. <laughs> Lamin bid the Kishki Lamin Lamal Police Mish Police Were Rais Mish Rais Will Call Mish Riadi Shumadam Al Fadi El Police Mabahmina Behmili Ben Abu Fina راحت كل أراضينا بس الناس جون بتكفينا البوليس مش بوليسنا